So we're, we're here to talk about your brand new book, Being You. I'm learning a ton about consciousness and you've been researching this stuff for a while. So real quick, I guess, I guess a great place to start. And this might take up the whole hour, but how do you, how do you define what is, what is consciousness in this simplest form? You're right. It might take up the whole hour. So let's make sure it doesn't. Uh, <laughs> Partly because we don't need a complete exhaustive definition that everyone agrees on. I mean, definitions often, you know, they come along with the science or they come after it. They don't sort of have to always be the starting point, but yeah. we need to know what we're talking about, right? Yeah. We need to not be talking about different things. So for me, consciousness is very simply any kind of subjective experience whatsoever. Mm -hmm. It is in the words of the philosopher, Thomas Nagel. For a conscious organism, there is something it is like to be that organism. There's something it's like to be me, something it's like to be you, mm -hmm. but nothing it's like to be a table or a chair or a laptop computer. Mm -hmm. That's what consciousness is. It's just the space in which experiences occur. Mm -hmm. So, so here's, here's one of the reasons I was dying to talk with you. So as I read, like, I try to read on every single subject I can. I know that, you know, there's like. I think everything's important, right? And I'm trying, I've been, I've been reading about consciousness and a little bit, we'll talk about the self and everything. I first started getting interested when I got into meditation and mindfulness and learning about like Buddhist philosophy and stuff. But when it comes to consciousness and, and I, I hope this doesn't like, uh, you know, uh, downplay the work, but like, I'm trying to understand, right? Like the importance behind the research, right? Like you've been studying this stuff for years. So like off the top of my head. I think of like, okay, the future of like artificial intelligence, right? But you know, when it comes to our human experience, like where does this, where does this interact with kind of like mainstream stuff that affects our daily lives or, or is it like more like psychology or, you know what I mean? Like, I guess what, what's the end goal for studying all this stuff? It's, it's a really good question. There's a temptation to think that consciousness research is a bit of a idle luxury, right? It's sitting in an armchair, pondering one of the great mysteries of the universe. And that's all very well, but what's the point? Yeah. And I think that would be a mistake. I mean, it is that, but there are also many practical, important reasons to gain a better understanding of consciousness. And these go from things we are all familiar with, like how does anesthesia work? How do we measure anesthetic depth in, in the hospital? Uh, how can we better understand psychiatric conditions, you know, a psychiatric condition, whether it's depression or psychosis, uh, is really a disturbance in conscious experience, the way we experience the world or, or, or the self. And in psychiatry, we just don't have a very good grasp on the detailed mechanisms that give rise to psychiatric symptoms. So there's a whole, and there, there's more, I mean, there's many swathes of medicine that could really benefit from uh, a focused understanding of the mechanisms that, that shape conscious experiences. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, you mentioned machine learning and AI, and I think that's also hugely important. And here, it's not about building a conscious machine. Actually, I think that would be a very bad thing to do yeah. ethically. We don't want to do that. I mean, you don't want to massively increase the potential of suffering in, in the universe and many things that we and other animals seem to be able to do in virtue of being conscious, it allows us to behave very flexibly in the world, to integrate a lot of information from different sorts of perception in one place, in one experience. So there are ways, and this is something I have been working on. There are ways we can improve machine learning, improve AI, improve technology by leveraging a deeper understanding of what mm -hmm. consciousness brings to the table for us. But finally, yeah. you know, there is this personal level thing that we're all, I, we're all curious about who we are and what does it mean to be me? Mm. How do I navigate all the, all the challenges of being a human and being someone who is also ultimately aware that life comes to an end and that our existence is circumscribed in time. And here, an understanding of consciousness meshes very well with, as you said, things like meditation, uh, other, other forms of, of developing an understanding that you know, who we are is not sort of essence of me perched inside the skull that's separate yeah. from the world. Uh, but it's, it's always changing. It's a, it's a persisting construction. It doesn't devalue it. I think a scientific understanding of consciousness enriches the experience of being a self because we take it less for granted, but we can also 
understand more about how it develops, how it changes and how ultimately it will dissolve. Yeah. Well, hey, you you just sold me, especially because my background, like, you know, I'm really into mental health. I started out like just uh, studying psychology and stuff like that. And, you know, like, I'm like, oh, OK, that makes sense. But yeah. Uh, and you mentioned, you know, uh, anesthesia and stuff. And you talk about that in the book. And I, I've started to become really interested in that stuff about, you know, uh, when you're, when you're under, like, uh, you know, when you're getting a medical procedure or you discuss like our dream states and that kind of consciousness that comes in now, are we conscious or not? But when you mentioned that, I was thinking too, does your work, and this is actually part of your book I was just reading and thinking about, like, does your work ever cross over into, I guess, like medical ethics, right? Because all over the world, depending on the country you're in, there's a lot of ethical questions about uh, people in comas and life support. And I think a lot of it boils down to consciousness or or even right now in the States, there's, there's that huge, uh, you know, controversy going on in Texas about the abortion laws and they're trying to, you know, get rid of it and stuff. So I'm like, huh, like how, how much of this is, uh, does your work ever get involved in ethics? Are you ever asked to like, you know, present your research and what your thoughts are on that? Occasionally. Yeah. I think it's a little indirect. Like the work that I do in my lab is not directly on you know, when consciousness emerges in the lifespan or mm. on, uh, whether people in the vegetative states are conscious or not after severe brain damage, but, but generally as a, as a field. You're absolutely right that there are very, very important points of, of ethical relevance mm. that people you know, like me and, and others are increasingly asked to speak about. So medical ethics, for instance, in terms of caring for, for people after severe brain injury, that's a big one, right? You have people mm. who might suffer a severe brain trauma and they would often receive a diagnosis of, of the vegetative state sometimes. And, and that typically is taken to mean that they go through sleep wake cycles, but there's no consciousness there. There's mm -hmm. nothing going on on the inside. There's nothing it is like to be them. Uh, and of course, if you think there's no consciousness happening, then the way you interact with that person, the treatment that you might provide, how you look at them at the time is going to be very different. And in one of the, I think the clearest examples of the relevance of consciousness science, there are now new methods available for diagnosing whether consciousness remains on the inside, even if it's not observable on the outside. And that changes the game, uh, for diagnosis, for prognosis, for treatment, for establishing even basic channels of communication. And this is work led by people like my colleague, Adrian Owen and, and Stephen Lorries and, and their colleagues. There's been a lot of ethical interest in how medical practice changes, uh, because of these insights from consciousness science, but there are other areas where also is developing importance, um, in, in the law, right? So we have this basic idea in the law that to be guilty, you have to have had both means and motivation. Um, and there are already cases where people have done horrendous things, but it's later been found that they had a brain tumor or something like that. They had some condition where the argument could be raised and was raised. Well, look, it wasn't them. You know, it was the tumor that caused them to behave in a particular way. So we shouldn't hold them responsible. Now, this is the area of neuro law, right? And the problem is that as you go deep in, deeper into it and have a, a deeper understanding of how we in without brain tumors in the normal case, generate voluntary actions, you know, do what we want to do. You could say that we're, we're basically all brain tumors all the way down. And should any of us ultimately be held responsible for anything? Because after all, we didn't choose to have the brains, uh, that we have, uh, we just do what we can with them. So they're really interesting areas of, of ethics. Then the final area that I have spoken at, at a panel of the national academies, uh, last year is this emerging neurotechnology called brain organoids. So these, are these part of medical science as well, really, but these are laboratory grown brain like structures, uh, that researchers can grow in Petri dishes at massive scale that have brain like features. They're not mini brains, but they have brain like features yeah. and they can be very useful for understanding all sorts of neurological disorders and conditions. The challenge is of course, these are little things that, that 
look a bit like brains, <laughs> could they be conscious? This is a, this, and they're made, unlike a computer, which is made out of silicon, these brain organoids are made out of actual neurons. In fact, human neurons, they're, they're made from human embryonic stem cell. Uh, so there's a massive, for me, ethical issue here, even though the organoids we have are very simple at the moment, you know, the trajectory of this technology is going nuts. And, uh, we have to worry a little bit about the possibility of industrial scale generation of uh, little mini brains that might have conscious experiences. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's really interesting. That's another branch that I've gotten, uh, really curious about is just, you know, the, uh, philosophy and like ethical angles. And, you know, uh, you know, recently I, I spoke with like Kate Darling and she wrote a book about like kind of robot ethics. Right. And I've been reading about that, but also, uh, it's funny that you brought up, you know, the, the, the law and ethics, because a few things, one of them, I was literally just reading that part in your book. There was, there's a story of a man I've heard it, you know, in some other books where he had a tumor, which caused him to, you know, be attracted to children. And I think if, if it's the same guy we're talking about, they removed the tumor and then he started having the behaviors again, they checked in, saw it was, the tumor was back. And recently I spoke with, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the work of Greg Caruso, but he, he looks at free will and yeah, he was just on too. And you're talking about free will in the book. I'm like, I want to get a nail and Greg Caruso together to talk about this. So I don't know. I don't know if like, if you have a, a, a stance on that, but like, what, do you, what are your thoughts around this idea of free will and consciousness, especially like if we talk about psychiatric disorders, right? Like one of the things which I don't even have time to get into is uh, the, the controversy around like multiple personality disorder. And the more I learn about consciousness, I'm like, I'm even more skeptical of that disorder. But you know what I mean? There's a lot of defenses that are trying to be used. So what are, you, what are your thoughts around it? Or are there issues like of people trying to... Uh, use that as an excuse because even the testing for seeing, you know, like, how would we know? How would we even test for that if the person was in the right state of mind and all that kind of stuff? So I'm curious your thoughts. Yeah, I think, well, I mean, it's, it's massively challenging. And the problem is that the whole legal framework is, is kind of based on an obvious misunderstanding of the way uh, brains and people work. You know, there is no separation of voluntary action uh, from the way brains are wired up and, and the way, you know, they they interface with bodies. And of course that's a product of, of all sorts of things of mm. your environment, of your development, of your genetics, of your recent experiences and, and so on. So there's, there's, there's just a, an incoherence at the, at the center of all this, which does make it very interesting because it's not, it's not that neuroscience is going to provide answers that will replace law, not at all. I mean, law serves a purpose. We just have to figure out how to bring, uh, the goals of the legal frameworks together in a sensible and rational way mm -hmm. with findings from neuroscience. So you do get people who, who want to lurch the extremes and say, no, we shouldn't hold anybody responsible for their actions because yeah. nobody chose to have the brains that they have. So it's sort of incoherent, but of course it's not all about evangel retribution. It can be about protection of other, um, uh, you know, the rest of society, uh, and it can be also, there's also rehabilitative justice. So there are parts of the justice system, which I think are very, very compatible, but exactly how you bring it together is, is really, really, really tricky. I mean, my own view is that there is a point in normal human development where the brain develops a competence to control. So mm -hmm. there's a, there's a sort of, it may not be a sharp threshold, but there's a point that in normal human development, we reach just as we reach points of competence with language and with other relatively advanced, uh, faculties where we act according to reasons that are, that are generally embedded into our culture and society. And we sort of know when we're violating those. So we have that competence to control. I think at that point, it does become reasonable to hold people responsible for their actions. Uh, mm -hmm. But if they lose that competence to control, whether it's because of a brain tumor or whether it's because they grew up in a, in a, in an environment that that was extremely challenging, mm -hmm. then it becomes less reasonable to hold them responsible for their actions. 
Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's interesting just with what we've talked about, you know, thus far, like what is consciousness and, and, you know, and medical aspects and legal aspects before we hopped on, I was telling you like something I try to do with this podcast is bridge that gap and get people interested in. And this is why I love talking about this because, you know, in a democratic society, we vote for laws and we vote for, you know, all these things. And this, I think this helps give us a broader view. And, you know, I, you know, I think your book is very well written and accessible for even people like me, who's not like <laughs> somebody who's like reading about consciousness all the time, but I think we should all be aware of this stuff. So we can kind of sit back and go, huh, you know, maybe, maybe it helps us make better decisions so we can cooperate as a society, because especially here in the United, in, here in the United States, like our incarceration rates are out of control. Right. Yeah. And if, and, you know, I was having a talk with somebody the other day, like you mentioned, like, you know from a legal point of view, the brain is just connected to your choices and that's it. We're in, you know what I mean? And, and, you know, there's, there's nothing that requires judges or, uh, uh, jurors to understand this stuff when they're making these decisions. And I think that's really interesting because there's guys like you who are dedicating your lives to studying this stuff and they don't even take that into account. And, you know. I, I'm curious if you can kind of break down just a few things. Like you're you're part of a, uh, it's the Sackler Research Center, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are what are some of the things that you guys are are researching and working on over there? What we do at the center, and what I do with with my colleagues and collaborators in other places as well, is is I prefer to think about consciousness as a series of related issues and challenges mm -hmm. rather than one big scary mystery. Like yeah. you can think of consciousness, like there's this massive thing we don't understand. How does it happen? How do brains generate it? Or why is it identical with certain aspects of brain activity? Uh, if you think of it as one big scary mystery, you end up looking for one single Eureka solution. That's like, ah, oh, that's now, now I get it. And that may be the way it goes. That may be how things pan out. But there's another way in which apparently mysterious phenomena can be approached, which is to uh, address that big mystery a little indirectly, try and take it by surprise from the side. Yeah. And you do that by thinking, okay, what do, we, what do we want to explain when we say we want a science of consciousness? And there are a number of different aspects. You can think of conscious level, this difference between being awake and aware and losing consciousness in dreamless sleep or in anesthesia, especially in anesthesia, or in some of these conditions like the vegetative state and coma that we talked about a, a minute ago. So that's sort of conscious level. How can we, how can we understand the, 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 the sufficient mechanisms in the brain for being conscious at all? And can we indeed measure mm. levels of consciousness? That's one thing we work on. And then another whole, um, area is conscious content. When we are conscious, we are conscious of things. There's a, there's a, a world appears, a world of objects and people and places and colors and shapes and so on. And how the brain constructs a conscious scene from what are essentially colorless, soundless, shapeless sensory inputs. They're just electrical impulses that the brain swims in, how it conjures, uh, a determinate precise, beautiful, rich, technicolor, multimodal, uh, perceptual world from that, that's another fascinating challenge. Yeah. And then finally, and this is where the book, the book actually goes through these, these different, uh, these different areas. We start yeah. level and content and finally we land on self because for most of us, and also for me, understanding consciousness gains its, its greatest personal significance when we think about what it means to be a conscious self. What does it mean to, to experience being me? Um, is the self some sort of essence of personality that, that is there hidden away in the head somewhere? No, you know, it's, it's something else. And the way I, I think of it, many others too, is that the self is just another thing that arises in, in experience. It's another collection of perceptions. Uh, and understanding how that happens, uh, is super important for some of these applications like psychiatry, but it's also the area that is, is most personally relevant. You know, we all want to understand who we are and what it means to be a person in the world. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, that, 
that brings up a question I have. So like, I, you know, now that I think about it here, you can kind of go through this. I'm like, maybe I don't read a ton of books on consciousness because it messes with my brain. All right. So like, uh, you, like, like you mentioned too, uh, the, the book kind of breaks it down into, uh, into different categories and everything. And, and one thing I'm very fascinated with is like perception and how our brains kind of shape our reality. And, you know, I don't, I don't have it in my notes. I can't find it in my notes, but you, you have a word for it. Kind of like, um, how our brains perceive and it constructs the world, but yeah, but yeah, like I'm curious for you and maybe you can give me some advice. Like does you do this all day, every day. Does yep. this ever like mess with your head? Right. Because there's like that thought experiment where it's like, how do you know you're not just a brain floating in a vat and just, you know, yeah. and I just, I just watched the matrix with my son the other day, introduced um, him to that and still, and you know, and I'm reading your book and I'm like, how does Anil like not go crazy? Just like, Hey, <laughs> is anything real? So, <laughs> so yeah, but it, yeah, it's good. I mean, it does, of course, what, what I don't have the control experiment where there's another version of me that didn't do, you know, didn't do this and did something else. So. I don't know if I would be less crazy or more crazy if I'd done something <laughs> else. Uh, but I don't think it's made me go, go, go. I mean, I think actually it's enriched, uh, my everyday life. Um, mm. we, we tend to walk around the world in this state of what I might call naive realism. Like you open your eyes and you think, okay, that the car over there is red. It really is red. That redness really exists out there in the world. Yeah. Um, and of course that's not true and it's not only in my work or not any neuroscience. I and mean, this is a very old insight, goes to physics, philosophy, lots of ways. You know, will tell us that even, even art history, Suzanne said, color is where the brain and the universe meet. Mm -hmm. uh, stuff exists in the world. I'm not saying that nothing exists and it's all just made up and we to, to bring, you know, our, our minds invent object to reality. No, there is a real world out there, but the way the world appears to us in our experience is always a construction. I call it a controlled hallucination. That's what I'm And the control, <laughs> yeah, but, but critically, the control is equally important to the hallucination part there. I'm not saying that everything is made up. No, the hallucination aspect is simply to say that all our, all our perceptual experiences are constructions of a sort. They're all generated by the brain, but that they are in a normal case anyway, reined in controlled by the sensory data in, in ways that make it you in ways that are useful for our prospects of staying alive. Yeah. So we don't jump out in front of a moving bus. That would be a bad idea. There is yeah. really something there. It's going to hurt. Uh, but when we, you know, when we typically use the word hallucination, we can think of that equally as uncontrolled perception so that, um, you know, our brains estimates about what's going out, got on in the world, lose their grip mm. on, on reality. And then. And usually we notice that because we, we start disagreeing. I'll say like, I don't see a car or a person and somebody else might say, oh, well, I, I do. And then one of us, uh, is, is wrong. And one of us, uh, is, has perceptual, uh, inferences that have lost grip on what's actually going on out there. But sorry, I've, I've, I've to get back to your point, understanding perceptual experience as a construction, I think is, is, uh, is a very useful way of, of just, um, accounting for, for how we exist in the world. It's sort of, it means that, that in a way, it's a little bit like meditation. We sort of, it allows us to understand better that other people might not only understand things differently, but also experience things differently. We can come to a greater recognition mm. that all of us have different internal uh, worlds that can be, that can be very useful. And then of course the understanding of the self as a perception too, I think is enormously helpful in everyday life. Uh, we, again, similar to what meditation can do too. We recognize that the self is just an evolving set of perceptions. There's, there's an essential yeah. impermanence to it. It doesn't make it less meaningful at all. It just makes it more grounded in the world, in the body, in our social, cultural, and natural environments. And for me, that's a very enriching perspective mm. yeah yeah and, and you know you know it's funny uh listening uh to you explain that because i you know i have i i i, I live in that place most of the time so i think i just need to remind myself but kind of like you said like it's helped give me a lot of empathy right understanding that i perceive the world in a certain way right so you know I, i'm a recovering drug addict the way i perceive the world 
10, like 10 years ago in my addiction, much different than now, you know, and as I've grown and matured and worked on my mental health, the way I perceive things is different. And, you know, just at the very basic level, for example, like I don't perceive the way someone's talking to me, you know, as them being mean to me or something like that. But anyways, it helps me do a perspective swap with somebody else and practice a little empathy, especially in this polarized world that we live in. I could be like, Hey, maybe they're just kind of perceiving this situation. I can have these kind of conversations and, you know, hopefully chill out. So I think that's why I'll, I'll practice snapping back and not having this like existential yeah. crisis. Type. And of course you don't, you mean, you don't need neuroscience to get to those realizations, right? <laughs> but I think, I think this, the, the story that I tell in the book and, and that is emerging and more generally is very much aligned with that. It's another, it's another avenue. And you, you know, if the, the more that perspectives align, the more convincing the whole becomes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and speaking, speaking of perception, and I just mentioned my former addiction, I never messed with hallucinations. So, mm. or like, uh, hallucinogens rather, but you talk a little bit about that in the book as well. So can you, can you help like break it down for me? How, uh, you talk about LSD specifically, how does LSD affect consciousness? Is it like, I, like I, the way I understand, like, is it unlocking more parts of the brain, uh, are new chemicals released that help us access stuff and yeah. Can you simplify that for me a little? So I, I better understand how that works. I, I wish I could give you a, a simple answer. I, I, it's not really known. I mean, this is why it's interesting and, and exciting. Mm -hmm. And of course, research into psychedelic drugs has been off the table for a long time. It's been sort of out illegal, uh, to do research, but recently it's become possible in a few places. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, this is a great thing both for medical reasons, there's a lot of interesting clinical benefits that might be gained, mm. uh, for treating things like, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, certain cases of depression as well, certain things, even addiction, actually, some of the earliest mm. clinical, uh, applications of psychedelics were in, in addiction. Um, but from a, another perspective of just understanding, shedding light on consciousness, they're also extremely powerful because you have a situation where you give somebody a pharmaceutical substance, we know exactly what it is. And we know a great deal as a community, we know a great deal about the immediate effects of a psychedelic. So we know that it binds to a very specific kind of cell mm -hmm. or part of a, a cell in, in the brain. It binds to the so-called serotonin 2A receptor, which is like a little, you know, a little socket that, that you find on the surface of, of neurons. Um, so we know that it does that and we know where these receptors are in the brain. They're not everywhere, but they're in many places. So that's one level. And then at the other end of the scale, there are these dramatic and pervasive changes in conscious experience. Things are different. There are visual hallucinations, perceptual hallucinations. There's often a sense of ego dissolution where the boundary between the self and the world becomes less well-defined or perhaps even, even absent. Um, there's lots of emotional fluidity. There are all sorts of things that happen. And so they all are traceable to, you know, this, this compound, you take it, stuff happens when it's worn off, things are back to normal. Yeah. Uh, and it's filling in the gap in the middle, uh, which is the work that remains to be done. Uh, our group and some other groups have been finding some of the pieces of that puzzle, but it's certainly not, not complete. One idea, uh, so one of the things we found is that different parts of the brain speak to each other less in the psychedelic state. Mm -hmm. So there's less information flow between different brain regions. Um, over time, the, there's more diversity in the, in brain activity. If you like, the brain is a little more random. Huh. So, and so that's interesting. So one of my questions was, was going to be, you know, is it illegal for you guys to study it too? Like the psychedelics sounds like it is. So I, and, and like you mentioned, so, you know, I'm, I'm big into mental health and stuff like that. And, hmm. uh, I I've seen it. I've seen just so many good reports. Uh, I, so I worked at a mental health uh, and addiction treatment center and a lot of our clients, um, some of them would go down to like Mexico and do like ayahuasca or some kind of hallucinogen. They'd have this experience and it would help. But like you mentioned, like PTSD and we have so many people coming back from war 
and all these other things. And so from my understanding about the history of drug policy, I just know about, you know, the United States and I know about a lot of like the propaganda and, you know, we, we made uh, mar even marijuana illegal, even though alcohol is far more dangerous, it's, it's all bonkers, but I'm curious, you know, uh, for drug policy, I I'm somewhat familiar with the changes being made in the United States. I know there's a few different exemptions, but I'm curious, you know, where you're at in the research you're doing, like how you said there's a few places and stuff like, yeah. are you able to go through a process or like submit like a proposal to use, you know, uh, these drugs in certain quantities to test or, you know, how's it, how's that over there? It's, it's much the same as in the U S and well, you're right there. Things are changing in the U S and it's complicated because things change on a statewide basis there. And it's, 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 it's hard to keep track of, mm -hmm. um, some places are very liberal with respect to these regulations, others yeah. much less so, uh, but there's a broad alignment that it is possible to put a proposal through to do a research project or a mm -hmm. clinical research project, but it's still very, very, very difficult. Now I think it should be quite difficult. I mean, these are powerful substances. I don't think it should be completely deregulated and easy. Uh, and at the moment we're still at the stage where in, in my group in, in Sussex, certainly in my group, we don't have an active program where we administer psychedelics. So we collaborate with other groups who've already uh, done the hard work of getting the, uh, the ethical permissions. And we just sort of work with them on, okay, what, what data can we analyze in, in interesting ways and perhaps what new experiments can we do? So it's still very focused to, to a few places. I think that's changing, but I do think it should be a, a slow process. Um, yeah. and the same goes for this, this, the, the medical application There's a huge excitement about the potential medical benefits. And I think this is largely warranted. There's, there's a lot of good stuff that can be done because, um, just, you mentioned at the start of this, this, uh, sidebar onto psychedelics, uh, about addiction. And of course, one of the things about psychedelics is they are not addictive. Mm, yeah. they, <laughs> they just, they just aren't. And they're, often, they're sometimes being described as anti-addictive, but they, unlike, other, unlike the opiates and other drugs, they're just not addictive. They also don't seem to be physiologically toxic. Like it's very hard to overdose on a classical psychedelic yeah. to poison yourself. Um, but they are psychologically extremely powerful. So of course there's still a lot of caution has to be taken. And one of the problems that I see a bit in the, in the hype surrounding psychedelics in the medical sphere is that you, they're not a panacea, right? You can't just mm. expect to take a psychedelic or go on an ayahuasca retreat and everything's, everything's fine. You're okay. Yeah. No, it, it's, it doesn't work like that. I think psychedelics open a space where other sorts of change can happen. So I think the most, um, promising approach, and this is the approach argued for by many of the, my colleagues and people who's writing, I admire people like Michael Pollan and so on that, um, mm. something like psychedelic assisted psychotherapy, you know, you yeah. still, you still do the, the hard work of, of psychotherapy, uh, it's not a replacement. And I'm slightly concerned that there's a commercialization and a boosterism surrounding yeah. psychedelics, especially in the Bay area and parts of the U S <laughs> that <laughs> might, might undermine a more, a more cautious approach to, to really understanding how best to leverage the, um, the potential of, of psychedelics without everything going crazy again and the whole thing being shut down, which you know, is a worry. These are powerful drugs. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm so glad you said that. And you'll, you and I are, we're on the same page, right? Like that's, you know, uh, like I, you know, I'm here in Nevada and we actually legalized, you know, marijuana and stuff like that. But, you know, I'm, even though I'm 1000% abstinent just from everything, just, you know, because that's what I do. Like I, I am very pro using this stuff because the, the, the research backs it. Right. And, but like you said, there's, there's this issue where some people sell it as this just fix all, but like you said, like I'm for this, this method of, of, you know, like one of the things they talk about is just getting someone to a place where they can do therapy. You know what I mean? Getting someone to a place where therapy is effective because some people are very resistant, they're traumatized and all that stuff. So, so yeah, that's kind of what I'm hoping for. But like you mentioned, there are some places 
that are a little too liberal with this. And they're like, here, let's just sell mushrooms in the grocery store, you know, whatever. Um, but yeah, there, there are definitely ways that we could do this. So, you know, again, this is one of the reasons I keep an eye on policies and see who's voting what ways. And, you know, when it looks at, at politicians, because you guys are being held up in your work and your research because of all these kind of roadblocks. So hopefully, right. hopefully there's people over there too, kind of working on this. And I mean, the, the, a plug there, that it's, it's like, it's one thing to evaluate the, the medic, you just think about what the best trajectory for the medical use should be and how that should be regulated. But also to inform that debate, we also need a basic understanding of the question you asked, like, how do the psychedelics work? How do they affect conscious experience? Yeah. Why do they work the way they do? And these basic science questions also needs, need addressing, and there needs to be support for that, for that too. Cause unless we understand that it's all a little improvised, how we decide, uh, the applications. Yeah. Yeah. And, and speaking of psychedelics, since I got you here and, you know, I've had plenty of authors on here debunking, uh, uh, conspiracy theories and stuff like that. So based on th what you know about psychedelics and how they affect the brain, like there's there's all this talk, especially on social media, they like pull up these old CIA studies and stuff about mind control. Could someone like you give someone LSD and just control their mind? Is anything that you've seen just kind of make sleeper agents and stuff like that? <laughs> no, no, nothing suggests to me that that, I mean, I know that there are these things, um, I forget there was a beautiful Netflix, um, I mean, this the MK ultra project. Yeah. Keeps yeah. Getting, keeps getting described in these terms. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure we, you, you can mess with people's minds for sure, but, but, you know, no, I mean, the, 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 the signature effects of, of a psychedelic is people's behavior becomes much less controlled altogether and their perceptions become, become less controlled. No, I, I think there's, there's a lot of, yeah, there's, there's a lot of potential, but I don't think I, yeah, I, I don't think anybody is slipping. Yeah psychedelics into the water supply in order to, to control our behavior. It doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's really much like, just like with my real basic knowledge, I see this stuff pop up on social media. My girlfriend will send me TikToks getting hundreds of thousands of views and they're like, because we have the freedom of information act and we'll be like, see, they use LSD, like they experimented with it, but there's nothing, there's nothing, no documentation of this actually working. Oh no. But you know, one of, one of the questions that I've always had when it comes to just consciousness, neuroscience and all that, like, and maybe it's because I just assume we're in 2021 and our technology should be amazing, but I'm trying to understand, like, what are your main challenges with like pinning this down? Like you talked about your research and kind of, you know, it's not just like not looking at the big thing, but kind of looking at these side doors and everything like yeah. that. And, and I'm just, I'm just curious. So. Like to my, from my understanding, the brain, you know, it's, it's a lot of different systems and things like that interacting. Is, is that the main challenge or, or, you know, like what, why haven't we figured it out by, by now? You know, I think there are three main challenges, right? Let's take them in order. So the first challenge is, a, is it like a deeply philosophical metaphysical challenge almost. It's like, hmm. what is it we're trying to explain? And this is back <laughs> to the sense of mystery. Are we looking for some sort of magic dust or special source in the same way that at one time people looked for the spark of life and, and there, there isn't a spark of life, just, but life can be a property of, of, of certain organizations of physics and chemistry. Yeah. Uh, so there's, there's a deep obstacle and, and, and just basically what, what do we think we we're looking for? Uh, and so again, I don't tend to look for this solution to this single big mystery, but try to understand the different aspects of consciousness. And that way this big mystery might dissolve entirely. It might not, but it's certainly the, the most productive approach. That's one issue being stuck on the wrong problem. The next issue is also a little bit meta and it's very problematic, but one of the challenges of consciousness, actually one of the things that encourages this view that there's this big mystery that might be beyond science as we know it is just the fact that conscious experiences are intrinsically private, subjective. Mm. You have yours, I have mine. Um, we cannot, I cannot put a conscious experience, I can't put your conscious experience on a table so that a whole bunch of people can look at it and agree about what it is, right? Yeah. Only you have direct access. And in fact, that's a really 
complicated thing to say because who is the you? When I say only you have direct access <laughs> to your experience, the experience of being you is part of that experience. So it's it's not it's, it's actually quite a poor way of putting it. But the point remains that conscious experiences exist intrinsically, subjectively. They can't be objectively shared in the same way that other things in science can be. This is a big problem. But it doesn't mean that the science of consciousness is impossible. It just means the relevant data are harder to get. You know, we have to be more subtle and indirect about knowing what you're conscious of, what your conscious experiences are like. And then we can map those to, to mechanisms, things happening in the brains uh, and bodies using sort of normal science. Uh, so that's, that's a challenge. It does make consciousness research harder because of its intrinsic subjectivity. The third uh, obstacle is much more uh, technological. I think that, um, as you said, the brain is composed of lots of different parts. They speak to each other in very, very mm -hmm. complex ways. We have, we have, I think, really out of date, impoverished metaphors for for the brain as a physical object. It's not a telephone exchange. It's not a computer. It's definitely not a computer. <laughs> um, maybe it's something more like the internet. Who knows? But we have, we, we don't have a really good. Uh, powerful metaphor. Um, and we don't have the imaging methods that allow us to record from many, 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 many neurons all at the same time yeah. in knowing where they are and at really high time resolution. We have imaging methods that can do some of these things, but not others. Uh, but we don't have a, we don't have, we don't have something like a, you know, astronomy was, was just catapulted into brilliance by telescopes and by the yeah. iterations of telescopes. We don't have that. We can't see everything that's going on in the brain in the detail that we'd like to. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I guess my question is like, are there people like working on this? Like, I'm curious, like, I know, you know, technology keeps it and like, is this something like if, if, you, if I like froze you for a hundred years, do you think we'd be closer is there anybody that's like kind of like oh yeah headway yeah absolutely i mean one of the one of uh, probably just fueled the the view that i find frustrating but i do find it frustrating when people say and often people in my field will say like we still know nothing about the brain basis of consciousness <laughs> we've learned nothing over the last 20 or 30 years i can tell you i've been in this for well over 20 years now there's a lot more that we know now then we knew then it's not, I mean, I certainly know a lot more, but then I, I knew, you know, I was just starting out, but I think overall, a lot more is understood now about the brain in general and about the brain in relationships mm -hmm. and consciousness specifically, there's been an awful lot of progress. Sometimes it's hard to recognize that because from within progress always seems slow. Mm -hmm. We always want to, it was think, God, it's really been 20 years. Surely we should have you know, understood the mystery by now. And I think that become, you know, that comes from just the fact that life is short and I want to be around when it's all solved. And I don't, yeah, want, to, yeah. I don't want to leave it to future generations. Come on, let's bring it on. Let's do it now. Yeah. Um, and so that's, and, and from the outside, maybe it seems slow because there's still this idea that the science of consciousness is going to solve this single big mystery and it hasn't done that yet. So if it hasn't done that, it hasn't done anything. But if mm. you, if you, if you look at actually what's happened for theories now, which make different predictions, which actually have explanatory power for different aspects of consciousness, we have a much better understanding of what happens in anesthesia and sleep and coma and psychiatric disorders. We have a, we have much better technologies and methods uh, mm -hmm. for looking inside the brain and new ones are emerging too. So I, I'm excited about the future of consciousness science. I don't like to put a timeline on when things will be figured out yeah. because not only because we don't know how quickly discoveries will be made or how rapidly technologies will advance. But also, and for me, this is essential and interesting. The questions change too. Mm -hmm. in, in, in 50, hundred years, it's not that we will have different answers to the same questions. Progress will be reflected into the extent to which our questions have also changed. And that's something that's very, very hard to predict. Yeah. Yeah. No, then that, yeah, you put it perfectly right there. Cause the more you, the more, you know, the more you realize you don't know, and you start having to do questions and all that, but yeah, I, I only have a couple more questions for you, Neil. So in, in this kind of conversation, you know, something I do a lot 
is I stare at my cats and I wonder about consciousness, right? And you were talking about Thomas Nagel a little bit earlier and something that's always coming up in philosophy books. like, yeah, the, you know, what's it like to be a bat, right? So, so I'm curious with this, these technological advances, do we have any information about like, like, so, so consciousness it's, it's what's it like to be something Does does my cat have some kind any experience? Does it know? Right. Because I look at, for example, I look at my cats, these, these things, they sleep like 20 hours a day. Right. And sometimes they're just sitting there and they're just staring at a wall. And I'm like, is anything happening like at all, you know, for the visual effects. So, so I don't know, like help me out here as a cat owner. Yeah. And well, um, this is, it's a good place to go actually, because it brings us a little bit back to where we started about a definition of consciousness. You know, if yeah. you start with this very basic definition of consciousness as any kind of subjective experience whatsoever, then it's easy to think that it might be unfolding in different ways, quite widely across different species uh, in the animal kingdom. And we have a tendency as humans to ascribe ourselves an importance, a centrality in the universe that we might not really deserve. And you can think of the history of science as a, as a successive dethronement of our species from the center of things. We're not at the center of the universe. Copernicus pointed that out. And then Darwin comes around and tells us that we're, you know, we're not different fundamentally from other animals. We will have common ancestors. And so the last aspect where we think we're special, maybe in our conscious minds, in our rational conscious minds, um, maybe that's completely different, but turns out and my argument would be, well, no, that's, that's just going to be a similar thing. There are distinctive things about human consciousness for sure but it's not that we are at the center and everything else is fundamentally different. So consciousness is not the same thing as intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's not the same thing as what technically we call reflective self-awareness, which, which just means that I'm, I'm not only conscious. I know that I'm conscious. I know yeah. who I am that is having these conscious experiences. Uh, there's. There's this stage in, in human development where infants are able to recognize that a mirror image is an image of them, right? Mm -hmm. That means they have a concept of themselves as an individual separate from others in the world or other mm -hmm. things in the world. And that's all well and good. And it's certainly an essential part of, of human awareness, but it's not necessary for consciousness. Like nobody says that infants before passing that test at the age of 18 uh -huh. months that they're unconscious. No, you know, of course they're not. Nobody treats a, a six month old baby <laughs> as if it's completely unconscious. No, you, you care about babies of that age, right? They cry. You, you feel that they're in, in pain or suffering somehow. Uh, so consciousness in other animals does not require an explicit sense of self and very few other animals can pass the mirror test, for example, nor does it require some threshold of intelligence, you know, there might be some overall threshold. So it is a, it's a very open, interesting question. Where does consciousness gray out as you get towards mm. incremental simplicity? I don't think a single cellular organism, a paramecium is conscious, but what about a honeybee? What about a fish? You know, cat simple. Your cat is a mammal. All mammals share the same basic blueprint of how the brain is constructed, you find the the same structures that we know are implicated in consciousness in humans in a cat brain. A couple of theoretical perspectives might disagree with that a little bit, but broadly, at least I am confident that cats have conscious experiences, but what it is like to be a cat, of course, it's very, very hard to say. We can understand a bit about it, um, but we could never experience the catness of being a cat. Yeah. See, and that's, that's the, that's the stuff that keeps me up at night or I'll just sit there staring at my cat like that. <laughs> but I don't, I, I have one final question for you. And it's just like, there, there's so many things going on in the world. Like we're worried about, you know, climate change and nuclear bombs and America's falling apart every five minutes. And then all of a sudden creeps in always the conversation about robots taking over the world. All right. So I think there's a good place to have the final question. We've been talking about all the difficulties with studying consciousness and all these other things. And, you know, uh, I, I know a little bit more about, you know, like neuroscience and all these other things. And so here's my opinion. Like we are so 
we're, we're nowhere near robots just overtaking humanity. And I, I just, I, I'm curious, you know, from, from your research, where you're at, what you've seen people are working on, like, are we, are we like, is Elon Musk going to create these? Like, cause like some people are like, oh my God, like you listen to like Sam Harris or Elon Musk or some of these people, they are losing their minds. Are you, what are your thoughts? Well, yeah, uh, yeah. I think Elon Musk and Sam Harris have different fears about this, right? So there's the Terminator hypothesis that will sort of literally be enslaved by evil robots who, for some reason, intend to do as lots of harm. Yeah. Um, there are, I think, really substantive worries about the progress of AI. And, and these are probably things that, that Sam Harris and I would, would align a bit on. And they don't, they don't take the sci-fi Terminator form at all. It's much more that AI is accelerating rapidly and it's incredibly socially and economically disruptive. I mean, certain jobs will just disappear just as in the industrial revolution, certain jobs disappear and never came back. Yeah. Other jobs were created, but they weren't jobs that, that could be done by the people who lost their jobs in, in the cotton mill yeah. and so on, right. Um, or the steel mills, um, AI is automating many, many things. It's going to be massively disruptive. This is a, this is a clear and present problem and it needs mm -hmm. to be separated from this, I think, very, very vague and sci-fi narrative driven Terminator idea. I don't think we're close to robots taking over the world, but I do think we're close to a large, uh, socioeconomic disruption. The other part of this, and actually this is very, cause you, we kind of track through the book too, cause we talk about consciousness and humans and free will and then animals and, and, and eventually, uh, the prospect of machine consciousness, because it's perfectly possible for AI to have all these disruptive influences mm -hmm. without any consciousness going on at all. So we, we may build powerful robots or sophisticated AI systems that, uh, just have no experience back to the Thomas Nagel definition and there's nothing it is like to be my iPhone. Uh, yeah. At least I don't think there is. Um, <laughs> at what point will there be something it is like to be an iPhone? And here, I think there's just a humility we need to bring to the, to the table. Um, mm -hmm. one of the big open questions in consciousness is does the material matter? Is this question of substrate dependency that, that comes up in philosophy, like human in biology, animals, animal brains are made of, of neurons and we're, we're carbon based systems. Mm -hmm. Is there a good reason why only carbon based systems can be conscious or could a silicon system also be conscious? I don't know the answer to that. I think so, but I'm very uncomfortable with a strong assumption either way. And I'm especially uncomfortable with the strong assumption that a computer, if you program it right, you know, the lights come on and it, and it's sentient, it's, it's aware that's based on a whole bunch of assumptions. Like the brain is some kind of computer, um, okay. is one, but it's, it's the more fundamental assumption is that the substrate really doesn't matter. And we know for some things that's true, like a computer can play chess and it really plays chess. You know, it's not just pretending it's actually playing chess. But a computer simulation of a weather system, if it's wet and windy inside a computer that's simulating a hurricane. Uh, mm. So the question is, is consciousness more like chess, where if you simulate it on a computer, it actually gives rise to that thing, or is it something that's more like the weather that, yeah, you can simulate a brain on a computer, but it will only ever be a simulation. It won't be the thing itself. And maybe you need in this case, life to breathe fire into the equations to actually make it like something to be that, that system. My intuition that we experience the world and experience us within that world with through and because of our living bodies. Mm. And that back to our earlier conversation is one of the reasons I find this personal relevance in, in understanding consciousness. It, it connects it instead of thinking it as some kind of advanced software program that might replace me and take over the world. No consciousness turns out to be much more intimately connected with my nature as a living creature. And then by extension with the rest of the natural world around me. And that's a very 
rewarding perspective where we see ourselves more part of and not apart from the rest of nature. Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. Okay, cool. Yeah, and that makes sense too. Just the disruption of like where we're going with artificial intelligence or more of like an economic type level, but not an apocalyptic type <laughs> level. So, yeah. So, so yeah. And that's, that's kind of, that's kind of the angle I keep an eye on and just, you know, with, uh, you know, laws and everything. Like, I'm always curious. I'm like, Hey, you know, they keep talking about how we're getting closer to self-driving cars, but we haven't really put any laws into place and stuff. So, so it's really interesting, but, but yeah. I, yeah, but I, there's, there's actually one of my, one of my colleagues and friends, somebody I look up to a lot, there's a, a philo German philosopher, Thomas Metzinger, who, he's making a very strong case as part of the European, um, I mean, European commission over here in Europe is, is in some ways quite forward thinking about regulatory frameworks and so on. And, and so, uh, Thomas Metzinger along with others is, is trying to get out there the idea that we should. We should proactively regulate against people even trying to build conscious machines. <laughs> um, it's very hard to know how you would do that, what that would mean in practice. But I, I do think it's valuable to have that as, as part of the debate. You know, we, we never, it's always better to be proactive and preemptive in these kinds of things, rather than looking back and thinking, oh, what have we just done? Right? Yeah. And how do we then contain the unintended consequences of that technology? Oh yeah. So social media is a, a prime example of that. They're just yeah. like, Hey, Hey, people are connected, but is that, yeah, just real quick question. I'm going to let you go, but what he's doing is that kind of like, like is CRISPR ever used as like an example? Cause that was something that was just like, kind of starting like, Hey, look, you can alter DNA. Is that kind of relevant to what he's working on? Like, is he looking as that as an example? I mean, it's in, if you take, if you zoom out far enough, yeah, I think it's, it's part of the, the, the picture because things like CRISPR, what they. You know, what, what you're looking here at is the, the sorts of how you change a whole human species. You're altering the germline, you're altering the, the channels of, of inheritance. Mm. That's, that's massive. Um, it's not just, it's a very powerful tool, but it, it potentially has existential consequences, uh, mm -hmm. for the species. So it shares that and in the same, it's a, it's a different kind of technology. I mean, nobody knows back to our previous point, nobody knows whether it's possible to build a conscious machine or, or even if it is what it would take to do so. Uh, so it's a non-existing technology, whereas CRISPR is an existing technology, mm -hmm. but the consequences of developing such a technology, either on purpose or inadvertently you know, carry the same sort of existential threats in this case, not necessary to us, but, but if we introduce machines that have the potential for suffering, you know, that is bad news. And that's something we need to think about before we actually do it. But it's very, very challenging because CRISPR exists. We know what it can do. We know what it can't do. When it comes to building a conscious machine, we are trying to think about these issues pretty much in the dark. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting stuff. And another reason we need to be thinking about this as a society, but yeah, thank you so much for your time, sending me a copy of the book to check out. I love it. And like I said, I, I appreciate that it's, it's accessible to a guy like me. So for everybody listening, a couple of questions, uh, is the book is out, but is it out internationally and where's the best place for people to follow you, your work, or even, uh, I don't know if you, you if you guys publish your research and people can kind of keep up to date with it. Sure. Thanks for asking. Uh, the book is out in the UK, uh, but it's not yet out in the US. It's mm -hmm. just been, it's out on October the 19th. It's been unfortunately delayed one week. So you might see misaligned dates, but the 19th I'm told is a firm date, uh, for the release of the book in the US and Canada. And to find out more about what I'm doing, and there's lots of, lots of other stuff, lots of papers and, and other podcasts, uh, you know, less good podcasts in the conversation with you. Of course. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Uh, the best thing to do is to follow me on Twitter at Anil K. Seth or visit my webpage, which is anilseth.com. Cool. Beautiful. Awesome. So yeah. So yeah, the 19th is right around the corner. So everybody will be having access to it. So yeah, again, Neil, thank you so much for your time and. And yeah, maybe we'll do this again sometime. Thank you, Chris. A real pleasure. Thanks for the invitation.